The most recent DNA evidence that I've seen in terms of peopling of the Americas shos this Middle Eastern uh, haplotype at greatest frequency in the Mayan people. So if that's your perception of where Lehi and company set up shop, then, then the DNA evidence uh, would be consistent with that. The critics are not conducting the primary research. And in fact, none of the published studies are designed to, uh, with the objective in mind of testing any hypothesis regarding the historicity of the Book of Mormon. That's not their specialty. I think, I believe one is a plant geneticist and another one is an anthropologist. So the critics are simply co-opting data from these primary studies and um, imposing their own interpretation. I would think someone like um, Keith Crandall, who is a population geneticist and a computer scientist, and a very good one. Uh, Dr. Keith Crandall, who is in the biology department down at BYU, uh, has only been in the church a little bit over three years. When he first wrote his, uh, his article about DNA in the Book of Mormon, he wasn't even a member of the church, and he saw the fallacies within the argument. The real issue is these guys don't actually look at the at the population genetic literature. They don't understand the population genetic literature because they're not population geneticists. So they couldn't interpret these kinds of data. It's a very tricky kind of literature and a tricky kind of data to wrap your brain around, but it's pretty patently obvious uh, when you look at their data in this one figure in particular. Uh, you know, if, you're, if that's what you're looking for, it's there. While some of them are, are scientists and, and definitely allow their opinion, they don't actually do the research themselves. They take the research other people have done and add their interpretations. So many, many of the critics are not, do not have expertise in this particular field. I like that statement that, that Elder Maxwell made, and I'll have to paraphrase it. But um, he said, in essence, he says, why do those in the great and spacious building really point, mock, and laugh? at the believers. He says, surely there must be better things for them to do. He said, but deep, he says, it seems as if deep in their seeming disbelief, there is belief. And sometimes you wonder if that's not the inner conflict that critics are, are trying to solve by being critics, trying to really convince themselves that they are in the right, perhaps at some level, knowing that perhaps they're not. For some, it has been assumed that the events in the Book of Mormon have taken place in a vast area, although the Lord has not revealed the exact location of Book of Mormon lands. However, through a careful reading of the text, we can begin to understand that the Book of Mormon events took place in a generally small geographical area, being one of the many civilizations inhabiting the Americas. Anthony W. Ivins, first counselor in the First Presidency and General Conference 1929 said, We must be careful in the conclusions that we reach. The Book of Mormon teaches the history of three distinct peoples, or two peoples and three different colonies of people who came from the old world to this continent. It does not tell us that there was no one here before them. It does not tell us that people did not come after. And so if discoveries are made which suggest differences in race origins, it can very easily be accounted for and reasonably, for we do believe that other people came to this continent. The best way for scholars to determine uh, geographical distances in the Book of Mormon is from some of the descriptions of the Lamanites and Lehite travels during warfare. Uh, they, they talk about how many days march it was uh, to different areas, and based on all of the textual clues that we have, it would have been a very small area, probably in the neighborhood of maybe four to five hundred miles long and maybe a hundred miles wide. Now, a lot of people don't think that that's a very large area, but if we compare it to uh, uh, Israel, what we have there is an area of probably three hundred miles long and forty to fifty miles wide. So, by comparison, it's not much different. And, and all the Book of Mormon texts talk about short travel distances. When we consider the, you know, overall view of those types of things, I mean, God has many different people and many different types of children. And to think that the Book of Mormon people were the only people on this continent and went on to populate it 
is a is is a massive stretch. We know that there were other uh, Native Americans, Amerindians living in the Americas for tens of thousands of years before the Book of Mormon took place. Uh, so yes, there would have had to been the Book of Mormon peoples would have met and intermingled and intermarried. The exponential increase in numbers of uh, uh, Lamanites, quote unquote, uh, in the early uh, generations of uh, uh, the Book of Mormon account would suggest that they were incorporating indigenous peoples and usurping control or influence over those peoples. Uh, so I'm sure there was a tremendous amount of admixture from the very beginning amongst the general populace. That might give explanation to the repeated uh, statements by individuals in the Book of Mormon that they were a pure descendant of Lehi. Why else say that unless that was some distinctive characteristic that set that individual apart in the social structure of the times? It was very likely that the rest of the people were, were uh, marrying and, and, uh, and, and uh, assimilating uh, individuals from, from the indigenous people. You read in chapter 7 of Jacob where Sherem came and, and he meets with Jacob. Now Jacob was one of the uh, original Lehite, uh, of the originally Lehite party to come to the Americas. And here's Sherem meeting with Jacob and he doesn't know who Jacob is. Now there couldn't have been more than maybe a couple of dozen adults at that time from the Book of Mormon peoples. Why doesn't Sherem know him? Um, he comes from a different community. You know, what other communities come from? He had to have been from some sort of outside community. He's just introduced by the words, there came a man among the people of Nephi. Came a man among the people of Nephi. Sounds like he wasn't of the people of Nephi. And yet he was um, clearly expert in their language. In fact, Jacob specifically states that he was, uh, he was expert in the language of the Nephites. Well, you wouldn't say that of a native speaker. All native speakers are expert in their language, but it would suggest that here's a man whose native tongue was not the one used by the Nephites, and yet he knew Nephite well. He had learned it. Contact with other languages causes languages to change more rapidly, and so uh, it, it's probable that both the Mulekite language and the Nephite language were in contact with other languages, and that would cause both of them to change uh, more rapidly than would have happened in a vacuum. And so the evidence says that haplogroups A, B, C, and D um, came across the Bering Land Bridge in antiquity. And you can debate whether or not there were you know, three different migrations, each representing the haplotype, or some think that there was now one migration involving all of those um, is, is up for, probably still up for debate. But those types, yes, seem to have close associations and affinities with either the Siberian or Asian populations. Well, new evidence is constantly revising and modifying hypotheses and theories about um, populations, in this case specifically origins of, of uh, Native Americans. Uh, I was, it was interesting to, to read very recently a, a, a posting by the Smithsonian on this very question of Native American origins. And they remarked that the, the simplistic notion of, of just a, a few, two or three waves of immigration from an Asiatic source is no longer uh, the consensus view. And that more and more scholars are acknowledging not only a more ancient arrival time uh, by Paleo-Indians, uh, Paleo-populations in, in uh, North America, but probably from multiple sources. Uh, some as, as uh, distant as Australia uh, coming across the South Pacific. First of all, we know that there were about 2,000 languages in the Americas uh, when Columbus arrived. Um, and only one, uh, well two, possibly a third language family has been shown to be from across the Bering Strait. This is a prime example of a paradigm shift. The, you know, the old paradigm of Clovis and nothing else prior to 11,000 years ago, that, that facade has finally crumbled and its fall is, uh, is pronounced. And, and um, there are all sorts of uh, new investigations, new evidence 